The Song of Pelennor, the life of Pelennor Whitestrake, assembled from various old fragmentary texts. Editor's Note Volumes 1 through 6 are taken from the so-called Riemann Manuscript located in the Imperial Library. It is a transcription of older fragments collected by an unknown scholar of the early Second Era. Beyond this, little is known of the original sources of these fragments, some of which appear to be from the same period, perhaps even from the same manuscript. But as no scholarly consensus yet exists on dating these six fragments, no opinions will be offered here. Volume 1. On His Name that he took the name Pelennor was passing strange, no matter his later sobriquets, which were many. That was an elvish name, and Pelennor was a scourge on that race, and not much given to irony. Pelennor was much too grim for that. Even in youth he wore white hair, and trouble followed him. Perhaps his enemies named Pelennor of their own in their tongue, but that is doubtful, for it means glorious night, and he was neither to them. Certainly, many others added to that name during his days in Tamriel. He was Pelennor the White Strake because of his left hand, made of a killing light. He was Pelennor the Bloody, for he drank it in victory. He was Pelennor Insurgent, because he gave the Crusades a face. He was Pelennor in Triumph, as the words eventually became synonymous, and men-at-arms gave thanks to the Eight when they saw his banner coming through war. He was Pelennor the Blamer, for he was quick to admonish those allies of his that favored tactics that ran counter to his, that is, sword theory and he was Pelennor the Third, though whether this was because some said he was a god-geyser, who had incarnated twice before already, or that, simpler, he was the third vision given to Perif, Anon Alicia, in her prayers of liberation before he walked among the quarters of rebellion, is unknown. Volume 2, On His Coming. And then Perif spoke to the handmaiden again, eyes to the heavens which had not known kindness since the beginning of elven rule, and she spoke as a mortal, whose kindle is beloved by the gods for its strength and weakness, a humility that can burn with metaphor and yet break easily and always, always doomed to end in death. And this is why those who let their souls burn anyway are beloved of the dragon and his kin. And she said, And this thing I have thought of, I have named it, and I call it freedom, which I think is just another word for Shazar who goes missing. You made the first rain at his sundering, and that is what I ask now for our alien masters, that we might sunder them fully and repay their cruelty by dispersing them to drown in the topal. Mora House, your son, mighty and snorting, gore-horned, winged, when next he flies down, let him bring us anger. And then Kine granted Perif another symbol, a diamond soaked red with the blood of elves, whose facets could unsector and form into a man whose every angle could cut her jailers and a name. Pelin El, which is the star made knight, and he was arrayed in armor from the future time. And he walked into the jungles of Sirid already killing, Morahouse stamping at his side, froth bloody and bellowing from excitement because the Pelinol was come. And Pelinol came to Perif's camp of rebels holding a sword and mace, both encrusted with the smashed viscera of elven faces, feathers and magic beads, which were the markings of the Aeliadun stuck to the redness that hung from his weapons, and he lifted them, saying, These were their eastern chieftains, no longer full of their talking. Volume 3 On His Enemy Pelennor Whitestrake was the enemy of all elfkind that lived in Sirid in those days. Mainly, though, he took it upon himself to slay the sorcerer kings of the Aeliads in prearranged open combats rather than at war. The fields of rebellion he left to the growing armies of the Paravania and his bull nephew. Pelennor called out Haramir of copper and tea into a duel at the Tor and ate his neck veins while screaming praise to Riemann, a name that no one knew yet. Gordhaur the Shaper's head was smashed upon the goat-faced altar of Ninindava, and in his wisdom, Pelennor set a small plague spell to keep that evil from reforming by welkined magic. Later that season, Pelennor slew Hadhul on the granite steps of Sayatar, the Fire King spears knowing their first refute. For a time, no weapon of the Aeliads could pierce his armor, which Pelennor admitted was unlike any crafted by men, but would say no more even when pressed. When Huna, whom Pelennor raised from grain slave to hoplite and loved well, took death from an arrowhead made from the beak of Selethalel the Singer, the White Strake went on his first madness. 
he wrought destruction from Narlame all the way to Celadil, and erased those lands from the maps of elves and men and all things in them. And Perif was forced to make sacrifice to the gods to keep them from leaving the earth in their disgust. And then came the storming of White Gold, where the Aeliads had made pact with the Aurorans of Meridia, and summoned them, and appointed the terrible and golden-hued half-elf Umaril the Unfeathered as their champion. And for the first time since his coming, it was Pelinol who was called out to battle by another, for Umaril had the blood of the Ada and would never know death. Volume 4 On His Deeds Pelinol drove the sorcerer armies past the Nibbin, claiming all the eastern lands for the rebellion of the Paravania. And Kine had to send her rain to wash the blood from the villages and forts that no longer flew Aeliad banners, for the armies of men needed to make camps of them as they went forward. And he broke the doors open for the prisoners of the Vatash with the slave queen flying on Mora House above them, and men called her Al-Esh for the first time. He entered the gate to win back the hands of the thousand strong of Sidor, a tribe now unknown but famous in those days, which the Aeliads had stolen in the night, two thousand hands that he brought back in a wagon made of demon bone, whose wheels trailed the sound of women when ill at heart. And after the first pogrom, which consolidated the northern holdings for the men of Creth, he stood with white hair gone brown with elf blood at the bridge of Heldon, where Perif's falconers had sent for the Nords, and they, looking at him, said that Shore had returned, but he spat at their feet for profaning that name. He led them anyway into the heart of the hinterland west, to drive the Aeliads inward, towards the Tower of White Gold, a slow retreating circle that could not understand the power of man's sudden liberty, and what fury idea that brought. His mace crushed the Thundernax that Umaril sent his harriers on the rebellion's long march back south and east, and carried Mora House Breath of Kind to Zuathas, the clever cutting man for healing when the bull had fallen to a volley of bird beaks. And of course at the Council of Skiffs, where all of the Paravania's armies and all of the Nords shook with fear at the storming of White Gold, so much so that the Al Esh herself counseled delay. Pelinol grew furious and made names of Umaril, and made names of what cowards he thought he saw around him, and then made for the tower by himself, for Pelinol often acted without thought. Volume 5 On His Love of Mora House It is a solid truth that Mora House was the son of Kine, but whether or not Pelinol was indeed the Chesarean is best left unsaid, for once Plantinu, who favored the short sword, said it, and that night he was smothered by moths. It is famous, though, that the two talked of each other as family, with Mora House as the lesser, and that Pelinol loved him and called him nephew, but these could be merely the fancies of immortals. Never did Pelinol counsel Mora House in time of war, for the man-bull fought magnificently and led men well, and never resorted to madness, but the white strake did warn against the growing love with Perif. We are Ada more, and change things through love. We must take care lest we beget more monsters on this earth. If you do not desist, she will take to you, and you will transform all Sirid if you do this. And to this, the bull became shy, for he was a bull, and he felt his form too ugly for the Paravania at all times, especially when she disrobed for him. He snorted, though, and shook his nose hoop into the light of the Secunda moon and said, She is like this shine on my nose hoop here, an accident sometimes. But whenever I move my head at night, she is there. And so you know what you ask is impossible. Volume 6. On His Madness. And it is said that he emerged into the world like a Padamaic, that is, born by Sithis and all the forces of change therein. Still others, like Fift of New Teed, say that beneath the Pelinol's star armor was a chest that gaped open to show no heart, only a red, rage-shaped diamond fashion, singing like a mindless dragon, and that this was proof that he was a myth echo, and that where he trod were shapes of the first urging. Pelinol cared for none of this, and killed any who would speak god logic, except for fair Perif, who he said, enacts rather than talks, as language without exertion is dead witness. 
When those soldiers who heard him say this stared blankly, he laughed and swung his sword, running into the reign of kind to slaughter their alien captives, screaming, Oh, AKA, for our shared madness I do this. I watch you watching me watching back. Umaril dares call us out, for that is how we made him. And it was during these fits of anger and nonsense that Pelinol would fall into the madness, where whole swaths of lands were devoured in divine rampage to become void and Alicia would have to pray to the gods for their succor, and they would reach down as one mind and soothe the white Drake until he no longer had the will to kill the earth in whole. And Garrod of the men of GE once saw such a madness from afar and maneuvered after it had abated to drink together with Pelinol, and he asked what such an affliction felt like, to which Pelinol could only answer, like when the dream no longer needs its dreamer. Volume 7 on his battle with Umaril and his dismemberment. Editor's Note This fragment comes from a manuscript recovered from the ruins of the Elysian Order's monastery at Lake Canulus, which dates it to sometime prior to the War of Righteousness, year 2321 of the First Era. However, textual analysis suggests that this fragment actually preserves a very early form of the song, perhaps from the mid-6th century. And so, after many battles with Umaril's allies, where dead Aurorans lay like candlelight around the throne, the Pelinol became surrounded by the last alien sorcerer kings and their demons, each one heavy with varliance. The White Strake cracked the floor with his mace, and they withdrew, and he said, Bring me Umaril that called me out. And while mighty in his aspect and wicked, deathless golden Umaril favored ruin from afar over close combat. And so he tarried in the shadows of the White Tower before coming forth. More soldiers were sent against Pelinol to die, and yet they managed to pierce his armor with axes and arrows, for Umaril had wrought each one by long varliance, which he had been hoarding since his first issue of challenge. Presently the half-elf showed himself bathed in meridian light, and he listed his bloodline in the Eilidun, and spoke of his father a god of the world river, and taking great delight in the heavy breathing of Pelinol who had finally bled. And Umaril was laid low, the angel face of his helm dented into an ugliness which made Pelinol laugh, and his unfeathered wings broken off with sword strokes delivered, while Pelinol stood frothing above him insulting his ancestry, and anyone else that took ship from old Elnofe, which angered the other elvish kings and drove them to a madness of their own and they fell on him speaking to their weapons, cutting the Pelinol into eighths while he roared in confusion which even the Council of Skiffs could hear. They ran when Moore shook the whole of the tower with mighty bashing from his horns the next morning, and some were slain in overabundance in the taking, and men looked for more aliens to kill, but Pelinol had left none save those kings and demons that had already begun to flee. It was Morahouse who found the White Strake's head which the kings had left to prove their deeds, and they spoke, and Pelinol said things of regrets, but the rebellion had turned anyway, and more words were said between these immortals that even the Paravant would not deign to hear. Volume 8. On his revelation at the death of the Alash. Editor's Note. This is the oldest and most fragmentary of all the extant Pelinol texts. It is, however, likely closest to the original spoken or sung form of the song, and therefore has great value despite its brevity. Strangely, it appears that Pelinol is present at Alicia's deathbed, although he was killed by Umaril earlier in the saga, years before Alicia's death. Some scholars believe that this fragment is not actually a part of the Song of Pelinol, but most accept its authenticity, although there is still much debate as to its significance and left you to gather sinew with my other half, who will bring light thereby to that mortal idea that brings the gods great joy, that is, freedom, which even the heavens do not truly know. Which is why our father, in those first days before convention, that which we echoed in our earthly madness, let us now take you up, we will show our true faces, which eat one another in amnesia each age.